the uh, opening statements in just a moment from and it's in House District Number 27. Uh, the District 27 debate will feature eight questions sent in by readers of the Arab Tribune. The issues raised in the questions are related to, but not necessarily limited to, pre-K, elected office, foreclosures, Medicaid, same-sex marriage, education reform, campaigning, abortion, taxes, constitutional reform, and redistricting. We'll cover one of those subjects, okay? We're now ready for the opening statement. We'll hear from Mr. Ainsworth. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Uh, I'm Will Ainsworth, Republican nominee for House District 27. Glad to be here tonight. I want to first off thank my friend Charles Wissonat for from an ARAP Tribune for putting on this event. Thank you. Also, Tom, appreciate you being willing to moderate. I want to also thank my opponent, Mr. McLaughlin, for your service in the past and look forward to talking about the issues tonight. I want to tell you a little bit about myself. I grew up in Boaz, Alabama. My dad's in the back and got to watch him build a business called Progress Rail. What I saw him do was build a business from one person into a corporation now that has 8,500 employees. He taught me hard work, integrity, and that treating your employees matters. And also my mom sitting on the front row and couldn't, I've got a wonderful mom. One of the things that she's passionate about is life and adoption and trying to stop abortion. Both of my parents are godly people. And they taught me at a young age that my faith is important and that service matters. While I was at Auburn, I met my wonderful wife, Kendall, who stood by me in the campaign and been a tremendous rock to me, and I love her to death. We're fortunate to have three kids. We've got twin boys, Hunter and Hayes, that are four, daughter Addie that's three. And uh, one of the reasons I decided to run is I'm concerned about their future. I'm concerned at the direction Obama and the Democrats are taking our country. If you look at the just how liberal we've got from a moral standpoint, from the amount of debt that we're racking up, it scares me. I was a youth pastor at Grace Fellowship right out of college. Built one of the largest sports camp in the southeast, had over 3,000 kids. We built a business called Dream Ranch in the Tennessee Valley Hunting and Fishing Expo right here in Marshall County. I'm excited to run for District 27 to provide people opportunity. I believe in service and if elected, you have my commitment, I'll work hard every day to make District 27 a better place. Thank you. I also want to thank Charles and the ARAB Tribune. I want to thank my wife and three kids. I appreciate them being here and putting up with me during this campaign. Glad to be here tonight. When you say forum in ARAB, uh, that, can be a, that can be a little difficult for a guy like me. And I've been in some places where I can't get past the front door. <laughs> I want you all to know that I'm a conservative Southern Democrat. I want you to know a little bit about my work history. My parents taught me the value of hard work. Got my first paid job at 17 in a florist. Started mowing grass and acted as a handyman. Worked my way through college. In college, I waited tables and bus tables. Paid my own way through college. Then I got a job teaching, glad to teach. After teaching, I went to law school. Got another job there, pumping gas, and also running a freshman dorm. I was happy to be able to be, uh, pay my own way through law school when I, got, when I graduated. I uh, went to work in Birmingham, uh, worked off my student loans there, paid back $100,000 in four years. As Soon as I got that done, I moved home, hung a shingle, and I've been practicing law and gunners ever since making payroll every Friday for 20 years. As you know from that description, I have to budget my money. I always have. Budgeted my money in this campaign. Why? Because I don't take any campaign contributions. I do that so you'll know that you will always know that my loyalty is to the people of the 27th District, not the campaign contributors. I have a little ditty about that that you might have heard. No cash. I won't take money. It's true. Just take a look at each shoe. I wear them out walking while talking and talking. So I owe my vote only to you. So please, I'll have one more quick message. Know this, please don't vote a straight ticket. I never have, I voted for the person. Please, if you have to vote a straight ticket, go down to that little, that, my name, 
fill in the bubble, and vote for Jeff. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Uh, you know, one of the reasons I told you in my opening statement I decided to run, this is something I feel strongly about, are my kids' futures. And if you look at what the Obama and the liberal Democrats and his liberal policies are doing to our country, it scares me. All right, I have a genuine concern for the future of our country and our kids not getting to grow up and grandkids for a lot of y'all in the same environment I did. So how am I going to do this specifically? Number one. Medicaid expansion, which is part of Obamacare. The state has a decision whether or not to expand that. I oppose Medicaid expansion because I think Obamacare is the worst law passed in my lifetime, and you better believe if elected, I'm not going to expand Obamacare in Alabama. Number two, immigration. I commend our Republican Governor Bentley for trying to tackle this issue. Unfortunately, liberal court overturned some of the you know things they tried to do to curve this, but you better believe states do things to immigration. Look at Texas, what Rick Perry's doing in Texas, uh, their national guard going to the border. To say that a state can't do anything when the federal government is not acting is not accurate. Number three, common core. I hear this over and over on the campaign trail. What business does Barack Obama in Washington, D.C. have telling our local schools what to do? I believe in local control. Matter of fact, we've got two of the top ten schools right here in our district. I believe in local control 100%. Abortion, gay marriage, these are things I'm going to fight for if elected. I don't, um, another thing, EPA, you talk about our costs going up. They want to regulate us and regulate us, and so there's a lot of things you can do from a state standpoint. Thank you. Okay, we'll try this one time here. Um, Mr. McLaughlin, your candidate specific question is, you have repeatedly said that you do not take campaign contributions, yet individuals are buying ads for you in the newspapers, and AVO is running a TV commercial for you. Is this not an in-kind contribution that you should be claiming on your campaign finance reports? What's the difference and not accepting campaign contributions, yet having others pay for advertisements for you. A very, there's a very simple dis difference, Mr. Kenimer. Alabama law under the Fair Campaign Practices Act does not define a campaign contribution as something that is paid for by a third party. A candidate cannot control the message of a third party. And the Alabama law is clear under the Fair Campaign Practices Act, section 17, 15, 12, any paid political advertisement or electioneering communication appearing in any print media or broadcast on any electronic media shall clearly and distinctly identify the entity responsible for paying the advertisement or electioneering communication. That's the law of Alabama. It's not a campaign contribution. But because it was raised by Mr. West Long some time ago, I made sure of it by calling the, the Secretary of State's office and positing that question directly to Jim Bennett, our Republican Secretary of State. His answer is, Mr. McLaughlin, it is our understanding that if a third party chooses to pay for a political advertisement without the candidate's coordination or permission, the candidate is not required to report that political advertisement as a contribution. I am delighted that some people have decided to take out ads, and I deeply thank you. I don't know what you're saying, and I appreciate it when I read them. I read them when y'all do in the newspaper, and I'm delighted with them. They're not my message. They're the message of third parties who want to get involved in this race, just as there are many other third party messages out there under the First Amendment. It's our God-given right under the First Amendment of the United States Constitution to speak our minds in politics. So.
Mr. Ainsworth, you have the first regular question, and it's on elections. Some elected offices should be completely nonpartisan, such as coroner, sheriff, dog catcher, etc. Can you change that? Can y'all hear? All right, sorry. The, uh, I definitely think that that's one of the things in this race that uh, I'm glad you brought that up. You know, coroner, sheriff, you know, those are things we do need to look at about politics. But our race is definitely one of them. If you look at what the Democrat Party has done, how liberal it's become, and just the overall amount of debt they're incurring and how they believe in expanding government and acquiring debt on top of debt, you've got to wonder why people have left the Democratic Party groups. If you look at the people that have left the Democratic Party, there's no question why. You know, Steve Marshall, Judge Hawk, Ari Martin, you know, Ginger Fletcher in the crowd tonight. Former Democratic Governor Arthur Davis. Yeah. Hello? Put it back on the tie. Sure. But I mean, it's what if uh, raises. something I would look at on some of the races, the answer is sure, it's something I'd consider and sit down and talk with people. But I think there's clear differences in our race and Republican and Democrat and what we do. It's not the coroner's race or the sheriff's race, okay? So I do think that's something that I would at least look at and consider. But as far as our race, it's very different. And what I believe and what I stand for and what my opponent believes and stands for is two totally different things. And if elected, you know, it's something I would definitely look at. Thank you. Would you like me to repeat the question, oh, yes, sir? Yes. Partisan. Etc. Can you? Yes, I believe there should be nonpartisan elections on a whole host of things. Uh, let me tell you. Let me give you a, an example. When I was in the legislature for ten years, I sponsored legislation for nonpartisan judicial elections. Why should it matter if a person is a Republican or a Democrat when they're interpreting a contract in litigation? Why should it matter if they're a Republican or Democrat determining whether burglary is committed in a criminal case? Why should it matter if they're deciding whether the father or the mother should have custody of a child? Republican or Democrat makes no sense in that situation. There's no need for it. Matter of fact, I would say it's counterproductive. Our local judges thought so, and I vote for leg I, I pushed for legislation and I got uh, to make the election of judges in Marshall County nonpartisan and across the state. That was more difficult. I got two votes short of getting a bill passed where we had almost had a constitutional amendment to allow nonpartisan elections. The person who stopped me was the Speaker Mike Hubbard. That is the now indicted <laughs> Speaker of uh, the House in Montgomery. <laughs> and nonpartisan elections should be in a lot of other offices. What difference does it make if you're a Republican or a Democrat to be coroner? What difference does it make to be sheriff? What difference does it make in municipal elections where it works just fine? We don't do Democrats and Republicans in, in electing mayors and electing city council. And it works just fine. So there's, and, and this, quite frankly, why is it in the legislature? Why don't we pick the best person for the job no matter what label is put on it? And what's worse is sometimes when you pick somebody by a label, and just the label, you end up with some folks in office who don't do good things. <laughs> so I fully support nonpartisan elections at every level that we can, can, uh, can use them, particularly at state and local levels, and particularly in judgeship. Thank you. Openness, honestness, and openness, transparency. Uh, all four presidential elections I voted in, I voted Republican every time. Who were the four questions? Who were the four presidents you voted for in the last four elections, sir? I voted for a lot more uh, presidents than, than you have over the years. Uh, <laughs> and I will just say this: 
I have never voted a straight ticket. Not before or after I got elected. I've never voted a straight ticket. I do. Uh, Mr. Ainsworth, where do you stand on nonpartisan judicial elections? Yeah. I Supreme Court, and you look at all the different races, what you believe and your values and what the party stands for matters. My opponent is in a party that stands for their pro abortion, they're, they support gay marriage. You know, so you better believe, I think, elections matter, when, especially when uh, the judges are going to decide our future and they overturn laws. So when my opponent says, that he, Thank you. Mr. McLaughlin, this will be your question. On one hand, the state of Alabama gets millions of dollars from the federal government through space and defense programs, but the state refused to accept federal Medicaid dollars to help Alabamians who need it the most. That hurts health care in Alabama. How can we expand the Medicaid roles without decreasing other services or increasing taxes. Uh, Alabamians are of two minds about federal benefits. There's no question about it. If it's defense spending, we want every dollar we can get. If it's building highways, we want every dollar we can get. But when it comes to Medicaid spending, for some reason we have a, we have a dissonance. Uh, in this state, uh, Medicaid, by the way, is not part of Obamacare. Medicaid has been around since 1965 under President Johnson. Uh, right now, Alabama receives Medicare and has been for 50 years. Probably two out of three of our elders are on Medicaid in assisted living. Half of our children receive Medicaid benefits to receive to, for their health care. So the question is, should we expand Medicaid because it's been made available to Alabama? And the question is one that I think needs to be answered this way. What is best for the people of Alabama? If we cannot afford it, then no, we don't need to expand Medicaid. But if we can afford it, let's look at the benefits. For the next two years, those benefits would have no Alabama component to them. Right now, one Alabama dollar draws down three federal dollars. In the new plan, if we accepted it, for two years, an Alabama dollar would not be required to get millions of dollars of federal benefits. And in year three, one Alabama dollar would pull down 10 federal dollars opening up Medicaid benefits to as many as 300,000 people in Alabama. So I think it's a question of priority. We need to look and decide what is best for the people of Alabama. If we can afford it, why don't we accept the benefits? If we can't afford it, then we don't. And obviously, we work to make sure those who shouldn't be receiving those benefits are kicked off the roll. But it, let's look at what's best for the people of Alabama. Let's. On one hand, the state of Alabama gets millions of dollars from the federal government through space and defense programs. But the state refused to accept federal Medicaid dollars to help Alabamians who need it the most. That hurts health care in Alabama. How can we expand the Medicaid roles without decreasing other services or increasing taxes? Thank you. I, I, uh, I'm against Medicaid. Because it's the expansion of Obamacare. It is. I've talked to hospital administrators in our county, and that's what it is. When they expanded Obamacare, part of it was expansion of Medicaid. They lowered the amount of money that Medicaid's going to pay out. And then they also expected all the states to expand Medicaid. Well, after seeing Obamacare, States right. And I'm going to find hard to make sure we don't expand. Why is that? Why do I believe that now? The funding is we can't afford it. Eighteen percent of the budget in 2003 was Medicaid. Thirty-five percent last year is rapidly expanding. I've seen estimates anywhere from a hundred to seven hundred million dollars that it would cost our state. 
Troy University. You know, it's a great study that talks about state expansion in Alabama. I support Governor Bentley on this and glad to have his endorsement in my campaign. But we can't afford it. It just doesn't make sense. Um, you know, there's too many other things. Then you've got to ask yourself, where, if we did expand it, where is the money going to come from? Are we going to take it out of education? What's that? Is the general fund going to be able to uh, fund it? Absolutely not. So to me, I'm a fiscal conservative. I'm not going to spend money we don't have. You know, if I go down there, I'm going to run it just like a business. I'm going to live within my means. And we can't expand Medicaid because it's expansion of Obamacare. And it is, it'll cost our state too much. Thank you for the question. I do. Mr. Ainsworth, I understand your position about Medicaid, so I ask you this question. What is your solution to the problem that approximately 300,000 people face in Alabama of being eligible for Medicaid but not be available to them so they end up in Alabama hospital emergency rooms without any means to pay for their treatment? How would you solve this problem? Thanks for the question. Uh, Ronald Reagan, which is the greatest president in my lifetime, said the best social program is the job. I agree 100 percent. It's why I want to give people opportunity to work with Governor Bentley to recruit industries where people can earn benefits and they're dependent on the private sector and they earn their own benefits instead of being dependent on the government. Democrats believe government's the solution to everything. Republicans believe in the people of the U.S. and we believe as citizens Uh, my position on Obamacare is that it has been uh, unpopular, it's been unworkable, it was rolled out very poorly, uh, and I think the vast majority of Americans are against it. I think uh, President Obama and Congress uh, goofed up when they passed it. Uh, time remains to see whether or not it will end up being a benefit to us. The more immediate question on Medicaid is whether or not it, we have the, the means to, to accept it. It's a question of priorities. That's what I think about Medicaid. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. McLaughlin, you will go first on this question. What is your opinion of same-sex marriage? I uh, got that question. Uh-oh, uh sorry. Can you hear me okay, or is that you? Can my time start now? All right, thank you. Uh, first, I'll ask you this. Did y'all ever think we would use the term same-sex marriage I, I, that's not a marriage. That's my thought. When I, when I first heard that term a few years ago, I thought, what? Uh, I, I'm opposed to same-sex marriage. Uh, now, I, I, uh, and it's, there's, it's not a close question. I'm for tolerance, but I'm opposed to recognizing same-sex marriage. Now, in Alabama, this, 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 is a, this is a bipartisan issue. The Democrats don't think one way about this issue and Republicans another. Not in Alabama. So don't worry about that issue with me. Uh, when I was in the legislature, it was a very bipartisan point. And again, let me say this. My actions speak louder than words. When I was in the legislature, I sponsored and voted for the amendment that's now number 774 uh, in our Alabama Constitution. And that is called the Sanctity of Marriage Amendment. That amendment defines marriage in Alabama in our Constitution as the union of one man and one woman, period. I'm good. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let me first all say this. Uh, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christ follower. I served as a youth pastor in our church, and I believe marriage is between a man and a woman, period. And when I say I'm going to fight Obama and their liberal policies, I'm going to fight as hard as I can to protect marriage in Alabama if elected. Um, why do I say that? Why do I believe that? Because I believe God created marriage. I believe what the Bible says, and that's my God. Um, you know, one thing I want to point out is this. You can laugh if you want, but that's what I believe, and that's what's going to guide me. I don't have to apologize for what my party believes on this. I don't have to worry about caucusing with people that have different beliefs on this. You know, I'm going to stand strong with Republicans, 
we're going to fight for marriage, and uh, you have my commitment to do that. You know, one of the things Rick Burgess, who's endorsed our campaign, our initial event, he said, you know, he's concerned our country, that even the founding fathers wouldn't be able to get elected today. And, you know, he believes we need godly men and women back in office, and I agree. And that's one of the reasons, you know, I want to not only just serve, but I want to take a stand when I go down there. And you never have to wonder where I stand on this issue or where my party stands. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Senator Ainsworth, do you know uh, why the uh, Constitutional Amendment 774 was passed? My understanding it was passed to protect marriage, to make sure that people in Alabama knew marriage is between a man and a woman. Thank you. You will go first. This One of you has said you would reform our system, and the other has talked about how the current legislature offer new laws on education that never should have been passed. No, I'm good. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I come from the business world. My background's marketing, so I like putting together flyers and plans. So we put this together. It's our five-point plan on education, and uh, you know I don't have to look at. It, I can tell you. Number one is this. I'm passionate. My wife was in education. Let me say that she worked for the Marshall County School System and uh, worked on the Even Start program and did a great job and had a passion for kids. Number one, I think if we want to have the top schools in the country, we need to pay our educators like we want to have the top schools in the country. So I support educator pay. Number two, I think we need to repeal or amend the Accountability Act. In, and the question is, why on that? Because we lost funding in our district, and we're not getting the benefit out of it. So we need to make sure that we get our funding back. That's step two. Number three, I'm a huge supporter of pre-K and a believe in the pre-emergent literacy skills. I saw that with my wife and, you know, especially children in poverty. Um, you know, it's a big help for three and four-year-olds and putting them on a level playing field when they go into kindergarten. And we know that if kids go into kindergarten on a level playing field, the chance of being at grade level when they're in third grade, you know, that that's, that's going to help them, their chance of being a successful citizen and graduate and go up tremendously. Number four point on this career tech. I'm passionate about linking the education community with the business community. I was excited after the forum in Gunnersville to have um, a person from Mueller come up to me and say, you hit the nail on the head. You know, we don't have a qualified workforce. It's a problem. So we want to link the two communities together to make sure we come up with solutions and make sure we have people job ready. Number five, I want to have an advisory council of 20 educators consistent of principals. Um, superintendents and educators so they can give me feedback on any bill that's voted on in the district so I can know what issues are important locally. That's our plan. We're excited about it. Thank you. How about if I say it sounds like the question generally is how would I reform public education? Is that fair enough? All right. Can you hear me? Okay. I want to say first I support public education. I'm a strong support supporter, and it's been hurt in the last four years. Let me tell you how I would start reforming public education. First, I would repeal the Alabama Accountability Act. That takes money out of our public schools and puts them into private schools. Our hard-earned tax dollars go into private education. In Alabama, each year under the Alabama Accountability Act, $40 million is coming out of the Education Trust Fund and going to private schools or actually currently going nowhere but out of public education. That's not right. In Marshall County alone, we've lost a million dollars a year due to the Alabama Accountability Act. I would, try, I would work hard to try to get that law repealed. The second thing I would do would be to repeal the Rolling Reserve Budget Act. The Rolling Reserve Budget Act basically puts Alabama in proration permanently. 
You can never spend the dollars available for public education as long as this bill is in place. Third, I would restore teacher pay. I would restore teacher, teacher pay. They've all received a cut over the last four years. I would see that our teachers are at least paid back to where they were four years ago. And with three kids in public schools, I will say we are spending $1,250 less per child than we were four years ago. I would make sure we increase that number back to what it used to be. Let's put emphasis on education, which is good for our kids, good for our future, and is a sound basis for true economic development. How much time do I have left? All right, let's place the same emphasis on education we do on football. We pay Saban and Balzon millions and we expect them to win. Let's expect the same out of public education in Alabama. Thank you. I do. Uh, you've been critical of our local legislators and Governor Bentley on some tough votes they had. My question is this, do you commit to the voters tonight that if a tough vote comes up on education that you will not duck the vote like you did on the, on the um, pay raise issue? Uh, Mr. Ainsworth, I voted against the pay raise. I never voted for a pay raise. And I'll tell you right now, I'll vote for public education every opportunity I get. You don't have to check with me. I'm voting for public education every single time, right down the line. I, I do. I heard yesterday on WBSA that you supported a pay raise for teachers, just as I do. So I'm asking you, do you consider my position conservative on this issue, or is your position liberal? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I think uh, the position on this is I actually have a position for education and recruiting industry, whereas my opponent only thinks the way to grow jobs and grow education is by doing away with incentives. That doesn't make sense. I want to support public education. I want to grow the private sector. By doing that, we're going to be able to pay teachers more, not by growing government. That makes no sense, the plan you presented at the forum. Thank you. What's the topic, Mr. Uh, Kinnemer? Candidates. The candidates. OK, yes, sir. Thank you. Both of you are running as a conservative, but on different party ballots. Given that you're both running as conservatives, how would you differentiate yourself from your opponent? Well, actually, I don't think that was one of our categories, but I'll give you a quick, good answer. Listen, I am a conservative. The notion that everybody who's conservative in Alabama has to be a Republican is just wrong. Christian value, Democrats have good Christian values. I'm, <laughs> let, me, let me assure you, my faith is far more important than my party affiliation. I'm pro-gun. I'm pro-Second Amendment. I'm the only candidate in this race that's been endorsed by the NRA. And I don't even own a hunting club. <laughs> I am pro-life. I've been pro-life all my life. It's not a political position. It's a moral position that I was raised with. I'm a Democrat, and I hold that value very strongly, as do all Alabama Democrats. There may be some who don't, but the vast majority of Alabama Democrats are pro-life. Don't get fooled on that. I'm pro-hard work. I'm, I'm against government waste. But why am, I, uh, why am I a Democrat? I'm for public education. And I'm not for, and in Alabama, if you're for public education, the Republican Party has taken the act to public education over the last four years. We've got to face that. And as I'm a Democrat, because I don't believe in trickle-down economics and special deals for special interests. I do not believe in that. I don't believe that by giving tax cuts to the very, very wealthy that the crumbs from the table is all we should expect and we should be happy with that. I've never believed that. Mr. Ainsworth, I'll keep the question for 
Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Both of you are running as a conservative, but on different party balances. Given that you're both running as conservatives, how would you differentiate yourself from your opponent? Yeah, thank you. I think it's a great question. I think it's a question that I'm excited to answer. Number one is this. You know, I couldn't be a part of a party that attacks marriage, that comes out against life and is, you know, I guess really honestly pro-abortion, and also at their convention takes God out of their platform and then realize, oh no, we made a mistake, let's put them back in. And then if you listen to the vote, they vote overwhelmingly to keep them out, but they decided for politics and to make sure it looked good, but they keep it in. I say no to that. I want to be real strong on that. And I say I'm glad to be a part of a Republican Party that shares my values. Same thing, I mean, I've told people this on the campaign trail. It's, I go to a church that shares my values. I'm a part of a party that shares my values. If you look in the county, when I talk to people, there's not many people that identify anymore with the Democratic Party. And the reason why is because the Democratic Party has left us. I mean, it's left the people of Marshall County. If you're using the word conservative, that doesn't go with Democrat. And my opponent can say whatever he wants on that, but if you're a finalist for an Obama federal judgeship, anybody understands that Obama is not going to select a conservative for a federal judgeship. That's a fact. And if you look at the people that I respect in our county, Steve Marshall, why did he leave the party? You know, Judge Hawk, I mean, he left the party. It was too liberal for him. R.E. Martin, James Hutchinson, I mean, Ginger Fletcher, I could go on and on. You know, the Democratic Party has become too liberal, and it is an issue. Thank you. Do you have a question, sir? Well, I'll ask this. You just rattled off a whole bunch of folks that changed parties. I'm going to ask you this. Who do you have more respect for? Somebody who changes parties because the political winds are shifting, or somebody that sticks with what he believes in and fights hard? When's my? Thank you. I believe that you believe it. I, mean, I believe that you're going to side with trial lawyers over business. I believe that, sir. I believe that when you look at your voting record, and it was 22 from the NFIB, which means 78% of the time you vote against business, I think we have differences. I think that there's a big difference. There's more to being conservative than being pro-life and pro-gun, of which, by the way, the only reason you got the endorsement, I had the same grade as you, is because you've been in office before. That's the reason why. I'm a lifetime. Thank you. You will start off with this question, uh, what's, the, what's the topic? Yo, yeah, what's the topic? Uh, the topic is abortion. Okay. The Republican majority passed several anti abortion bills during the past four years and a broadened parental consent law. Do you support the anti abortion measures that were passed? Yeah, thank you for the question. That's an easy question for me. This is a no-brainer. I believe life begins at conception, and I want to make sure I fight for life if elected in Montgomery. Um, you know, why is that? If you, first off, I just want to talk about my kids. You know, one of the greatest things about, we had twins, Hunter and Hayes. I remember, Kendall, we went to the, get our ultrasound, how exciting it was, and watching the baby develop. You know, I mean, it, it, that's a life to me, okay? And, you know, let's look at the facts on this. Uh, in Alabama, abortion's legal up to 21 weeks. Uh, at a 20 week old fetus, all the major organs are functioning. It sucks its thumb. It yawns. Uh, it, the baby blinks. Um, a fetus can feel pain at that time. So, to me, it's a, um, you know, it's an issue of life. And I, I'm always going to support life. And, um, you know, I'll do whatever I can do if elected to support life and protect that. And honestly, I'll, I'm going to go a step further here. I would love to be able to pass a law that ultimately ended Roe v. Wade forever. If I could do that, I would be very proud that 
because I Let me be very clear and unequivocal on this subject. I'm opposed to abortion. I have always been opposed to abortion. I'm a strong Christian. And I try not to mix uh, politics and religion, but on this question, it is unequivocal for me, and it has been my entire life. Life begins at conception, period. In Alabama, once again, this is a bipartisan issue. Alabama Democrats are overwhelmingly opposed to abortion. Don't be fooled and don't be misled. And let me also say this. Actions speak louder than words. When I was in the legislature, look at my record, because when I was in the legislature, I sponsored and got passed with Frank McDaniel the Brody Bill, which makes murdering a pregnant woman two crimes. That was new in Alabama. I sponsored and worked many years on the chemical endangerment bill, which says if a baby is endangered in the womb by exposure to drugs uh, or alcohol, then that mother is, could be found guilty of criminal, uh, uh, criminal endangerment of that child. Again, the child would be considered a separate life in the womb. So look at my record on this issue. My record speaks loudly. I will say this. Hand in hand with being opposed to abortion, I support, I support legislation making it easier to adopt children. I believe in consistently, consistency on being pro-life. Let's help bring the babies into the world, and then let's take care of the children once they're here. Let's help them get adopted, and then let's educate them well. So I have a seamless approach to it with this issue, and I want you to know that. Thank you. I don't. I do. You said a moment ago that you wanted to repeat to pass a law to overturn Roe v. Wade. Roe v. Wade is a 1973 decision from the U.S. Supreme Court. What can you do? do are you aware? that the only entity that could change Roe v. Wade is the United States Congress, and you are running for the Office of State Representative in Montgomery. Are you aware of that? I am, and appreciate your position. What I said, Jeff, was I would like to pass a law that ends up getting appealed, and then Roe v. Wade gets overturned because of that. I know I can't pass a law in Alabama to overturn that, so that's common sense. Thank you. <laughs> Do you really want to know? You really want to know. Uh, I don't need my note. The Alabama Accountability Act is the worst piece of legislation passed by the Alabama legislature in the last four years. There's no question about it. It was passed in the dead of night. Now, I've been down there. A bill comes to you, and it might be five or six pages or 10 or 12 pages, and a committee is supposed to review it. It takes a long time. Y'all remember, how a bill becomes a law, I'm a bill on Capitol Hill, all that stuff. Well, there's six, there are six steps. It's hard. It takes time. You're not supposed to substitute a bill in the middle of the night on the last night of a joint committee. That's what happened on this bill. One bill went in, and a totally different bill came out. It never went through the committee process. So the way it was passed was underhanded, improper, and probably unconstitutional. In addition, what it did is disastrous. It was a, and let me tell you what it was motivated by. I'll tell you, speak straight from the heart. It was motivated by a political payback time by Republicans against the AEA. That's what it was all about. It was not about our children. It was not about teaching them better. It was not about really helping schools. It was about politics. What we need to do is get all that aside, and we need to look at what's best for our children, what's best for children in school. <laughs> Alabama Accountability Act is not that program. The Alabama Accountability Act takes $40 million a year out of public education, takes a million dollars a year out of the schools in Marshall County, 
and it funds private education. Now, I'm all for the right to send your child to private school. Send your child to private school if you want to, but the taxpayers shouldn't pay for it, and that's what that bill does. And over and above that, there's one more point I'll make. Well-connected political people like our former Governor Riley are making money off of the scholarships that are provided under the Alabama Accountability Act, and that's wrong. Sure, thank you. Yeah, I said throughout our campaign, I'm against the Accountability Act, and the reason's simple, it's funding. And I'm a supporter of education, I think in Marshall County, you know, we need more funding in our schools. But the question is, how are we going to get it? Obviously, the repeal is one way. But one of the things I want to talk about um, on making sure we get more funding in education is how are we going to do it? Are we going to do it by expanding government? Or are we going to do it by expanding industry? And I'm a supporter of expanding industry in Alabama, and I do believe in incentives, but I've got facts to back it up. If you look at Mercedes, total economic impact of economy in Alabama is $6.8 annually. That's 4.2% of our GDP in Alabama. 41,830 jobs are created by, you know, something my opponent wants to do away with. But here's the kicker here, and all you people in education need to understand this. 106 million in taxes annually are produced by that. That's going to go in to improve our schools. You know, so I want to expand the economy. I want to improve education by also improving and giving people jobs and opportunity. If you look at Honda, another great success story. You know, total economic impact, 4.5 billion, 45,000 jobs created. Average wage of these people, 54,000. 21st century high paying job, 30 million in taxes. This is done by the University of Alabama. I mean, this is the facts here. If you're looking at locally here, Newman Technologies, a supplier to Honda, TS Tech, 750 jobs. HFI, 100 jobs. You've got Mid-South Logistics, talk about being against trickle-down. People, these, a lot of you people probably work at these places. You know, Syncro does stuff in the automotive industry. I want to expand our base and work with Governor Bentley to recruit industry so we can have more money to support education as well as repeal the Accountability Act. Thank you. I sure do. Thank you. Ms. Ainsworth, if you're re for repealing the Alabama Accountability Act, once again, I'm going to ask you, am I conservative on this issue, or are you liberal on this issue? Hmm? I don't think this is a conservative or liberal issue, sir. I think this is a pro-public education issue, and I think that, you know, I've stated throughout that there's some issues that aren't conservative or liberal. I'm pro-public education. I went to school in Boaz for, you know, 10 years of my education career. My wife taught in the public school system. So, you know, to me, it's, I live in Marshall County. I live in District 27. This is important. And so I'm, I support public education is my answer to that. Thank you. Sure. Mr. McLaughlin stated that the first bill he wants to pass is um, introduce a bill to repeal the Accountability Act. When you were in the majority with the Democrats, Every year you tried to pass and sponsor the bill banning pack to packs transfers. What confidence can you give the voters that you're going to be successful in the minority to repeal the Alabama Accountability Act? I cannot promise you that I will get the Alabama Accountability Act repealed, but I will be another voice to try to get it repealed. I will be another voice to stop the supermajority. And you, by golly, you betcha, I voted for that. I sponsored that pack-to-pack -pack transfer bill every year I was down there, fought hard for it, and I appreciated them finally passing it once I was out and naming the bill after me. I appreciate that very much. Yeah. Mr. Ainsworth, on the subject of taxes, there has been a lot of discussion regarding tax reform I haven't signed anything, but I've given people my word, which is my bond, that I'm not going to raise taxes. So, but I would definitely sign a pledge not to raise taxes. I don't think that's the answer. I think we're taxed enough. If you look at our corporate tax rate, we've got the highest corporate tax rate in the world. 
and you wonder why we lose corporations to other countries, it's because of our corporate tax rate. Um, you know, how, what do I want to do in, since I'm not for raising taxes? We want to recruit industry to District 27, and we put together a five-point plan to do this. Number one, we want to market the whole District 27 region as a whole, so we can compete with, instead of individual cities, so we can compete with Atlanta, Nashville, Birmingham. That's important. Each area's got something different and unique to offer. I want to make sure we market as a whole. Number two, I talked about this, placing an emphasis on career tech and getting people we call job ready. I'm very passionate about that. I want to make sure we link the education community with the business community. I think it's important. Number three, highlighting the excellent publication, I mean, public education we have. I couldn't agree with my opponent more when he talked about we need to make sure, you know, if we had the number three and number ten football teams, people would know about it. I mean, it's important. We need to tell people our story because when companies are looking to locate somewhere, the fact that we have outstanding school and my hats are off to the teachers for working hard, that's important. It's a great tool for recruiting industry. We also need to uh, make sure we work hard to restore our lost funding. Um, fourth point on this, uh, promote and tell people about our recreational assets. I love getting to market and tell people about Lake Gunnersville, the mountains, you know, what we have to offer here. It's so important to attract tourism and investment. And finally, we need to reduce the regulatory burden and red tape. Over and over again, I hear people say they deal more with regulations than running their business. And I think that's wrong. Thank you. On oh, this one, Mr. Kinnaman, I do need you to repeat the yes, question, sir. please. Thank you. Okay. And constitutional reform. Are these not just code words for increasing taxes? Will you or have you signed a pledge for no tax increases? So the question was about taxes. So let me answer the question about taxes. No, I don't think we need any new taxes. But I do oppose dipping into the Capital Improvement Trust Fund to balance the general fund budget. You and ARAB know that Mr. Wisnant put an article about this out back in 2012 when there was a vote about it. And I said then, as I say now, we should not be tapping the Capital Improvement Trust Fund to balance our uh, state general fund budget. That's Robin from our future. Anybody can balance a uh, budget on a credit card. And that's essentially what our legislature's done the last three years when it comes to the general fund. I would take a different approach. We should, in our tax code, it looks like a Swiss cheese. There are special deals for special interest. There are loopholes that you can drive a bus through. My wife shops at Target, and I love it. I hate to pay the bill. But Target doesn't pay its bill in Alabama because Target, because we don't have a law that says a co corporation that's a multi-state or multinational corporation should pay its fair share of taxes on profits it makes in Alabama. We don't have a law like that. So you know what Target does? It says, oh, gee, we got to pay the corporate office some money for some of the duties that the corporate office in Delaware gives us. So we'll say we have to pay Delaware, and oh, gosh, we didn't make any money in Alabama. And they pay no taxes. They're not alone. $40 billion in corporate income went untaxed in Alabama due to those loopholes. On the sales tax. You and I pay four cents to the state every time we buy a loaf of bread. But let me tell you, a lot of folks don't. There's a lot of folks that pay 3% or 2.5% or 2%. I've always said you could broaden the base and lower the rate. And know this, I'm for cutting taxes. I voted and put legislation in the hopper to take sales tax off of food in Alabama. And I will do that again. We shouldn't tax food in Alabama. I'm a tax cutter. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, did you ever vote for a tax increase in the Alabama legislature, and will you take the no new tax pledge? Governor Riley proposed an expansive plan in 2002 that we had to put on a referendum. In other words, the people of Alabama were given the opportunity to say whether or not they wanted certain taxes. Governor Riley, the Republican governor of this state in 2002 through 2010, offered that legislation, and the Democratic legislature authorized it, and the people of Alabama voted on it and voted it down.
I do. Mr. Ainsworth, would you agree that Alabama's tax system is one of the most regressive in the nation? And if so, what would you do, if anything, to change this? Yeah, I actually do agree with you on the groceries. I think uh, we should eliminate that, and I think that's a legitimate, good argument. So, thank, thank you. you. All right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. This will be our final question. All right. Very good. Oh, okay. <laughs> Can I borrow your poster? <laughs> I wasn't prepared for this question at all. <laughs> Other than the attack on public education, the redistricting mess is the worst thing to come out of Montgomery in the last four years. <laughs> this map was drawn by two people in this room, and they're here, Mr. Rich and Mr. Long backed by Mike Hubbard, the now indicted Speaker of the House. <laughs> they did this to make it easier for them to get reelected, and quite frankly, they did it to make it harder for me to get reelected. <laughs> they cut out Bill Strickland. This is where Bill Strickland lives. They thought he might run for the House, so they cut him out. This is where I live. Mr. Long and Mr. Uh, Rich were bouncing me back and forth during the process, and Mr. Rich won, and Mr. Long was stuck with me. <laughs> but you know what? Here I am. <laughs> and I'll say this. Blunt County, welcome to District 27. Glad to have you. DeKalb County, welcome to District 27. Glad to have you. If you haven't seen my video on this, y'all check it out. Please do that. <laughs> The real problem is that this mess makes Morgan County, Coleman County, and Blount County now have a vote in our local issues, and that's a real problem. I want you to know that in 2002, I participated in the last redistricting before this one, and you didn't hear a complaint at all. And I'll tell you one more thing I've never said publicly. I had the opportunity to get rid of ARAB because it's Republican. I didn't take it because I thought it would be bad for ARAB and bad for Marshall County. You never heard a peep about redistricting when I was in the legislature. Oh, no, I know it. Yeah, appreciate it. I'm the one responsible for redistricting. You paid attention to the speech. One thing I want to make sure you all is that I oppose it and don't agree with I'm glad you brought up Billy Strickland. I mean, his daughter, Caitlin, worked for me. And there's no way if I was in charge of redistricting, I would have uh, zoned out a supporter of mine like Billy Strickland. That wouldn't make sense at all. So I'm glad you brought that up. But Cherokee Ridge, if you look at that, the way it's been divided in half. If you look at, um, you know, the fact my own parents live in Gunnersville and they can't vote for me. That's a problem. And so, you know, you better believe that, you know, if elected, I'm going to, I actually agree with Jeff on this. We need to make sure it gets back to, I think if I'm, it's actually, it wouldn't be two, three because the population changes. But you have my commitment that I'll work to make sure we restore the district to where it was before. Um, and I, I just think that's the right thing to do. So, uh, final thing I want to say is this. Here's the problem. Neither of us can do anything in the next four years. Uh, the census isn't until 2020. I'm trying to run on issues on what I can do the next four years, how I can improve your life, um, how I can help people in the district with public education. And I'm not running on grandstand issues and doing funny videos, which I did think your video was funny. I liked uh, hopping over the line. That was kind of comical. But uh, Thank you. I actually did think it was funny. Um, but I'm trying to run on issues that can improve people's lives by recruiting 21st century jobs. Teachers make sure they're paid like they deserve to be. 
to make sure that our schools are funding to where we can have the top schools in the state. I'm proud of our public education. I'm proud of the workforce we have here. I want to help people improve. So, you know, I've tried to focus on this election to run on things I, I can actually control in the next four years. I would have to get elected and then get elected again before I could do anything on this. Thank you. Yes, sir, I do. Mr. Ainsworth, you may or may not know, I objected to the redistricting plan when it first came out in 2012. I was very loud about this. So my question to you is, although imitation is the greatest form of flattery, what do you mean by having a sign that reads like this? Sure, I, I mean exactly. I people that wanted to know what the signs meant, and I explained to them, and they came to me and said, I would like a sign like that, including my parents. I had a lot of people, including a lot of voters. So, you know, I think there's a lot of people that no doubt have come up to me and said, man, I love you, Bill. I love your passion. I love what you, your vision. I want to vote for you, but I can't. And so we wanted to get a sign. So thank you. You have a question? I'm just going to what can you do in the next four years? If the U.S. Supreme Court strikes down the uh, redistricting plan, and there was a cert was granted on it recently. If the Supreme Court cuts that says this plan is a gerrymandered plan, which I believe it to be, then you know what will happen? A federal judge will say, Legislature of Alabama, redraw the map right now. It happened to Alabama in the 80s. So we might get the opportunity to redistrict in the next year or two if a federal judge says we have to. We're now ready for our closing statements. Mr. Ainsworth, go first. Yeah, thank you all. And again, I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. You know, I think, uh, you know, one of the things I want to make sure everybody understands is I'm passionate about trying to make a difference in the district. Uh, if you look at our job creation plan, if you look at our education plan, you know, I want to make sure y'all know that you know, we put a lot of thought and time and effort into talking to leaders throughout the community, trying to figure out the best plan to move our district forward. One thing I want to make sure everybody understands is that if elected, you know, whether you're for me or against me now, you know, I want everybody on our team to move our district forward and would love the opportunity to serve. You know, I think of conservatives, we were talking about that, it's been a theme. I think of Ronald Reagan. I think of Jeff Sessions. I think of Dr. Bentley. I don't necessarily think of my opponent when I think of that word conservative. I'm a conservative Christian. I've always been a Republican. I'm a lifetime member of the NRA. I'm a Christian not ashamed of. You'll never have to wonder. Um, you know, I want to serve with integrity and honor and make sure that when I go down there, I'm a representative you can be proud of. If you've got an issue, I want to make sure that we respond to it and try to improve everyone's lives. I want to be honest transparent and truthful. And, you know, Kendall and I, when we talked about it, initially they asked, you know, would we run? And we said initially, you know, hey, we, we're, we're very um, flattered that you asked, but I don't think right now is the right timing. We prayed about it and definitely felt that this was what God was calling us to do to get involved to serve. Just like I served in youth ministry, I believe God gives you one life to make a difference, and I'd be honored to represent you You know, my commitment will work hard every day, will be transparent, will be truthful, and try to do what's best for District 27. Thank you. When I first considered running again, lots of people wanted me to run. But some people, particularly politically savvy people, told me there's no way I could win. They said there's too much money behind Mr. Ainsworth, and it's too important for Mike Hubbard, that is the now indicted speaker Mike Hubbard, to keep, his, to keep this seat friendly to him. And look who's behind Ainsworth locally, Mr. Long and Mr. Rich. Really, by all accounts, this race shouldn't be close. It leans Republican, not Democrat. 
my opponent has essentially unlimited funds. And the district was gerrymandered to make it impossible for me to win. But here I am, thanks to the good people of District 27. <laughs> Everywhere I go, I hear people say, we don't want another tool of the special interest. Everywhere I go, I hear people say, we do not want another yes man for my cupboard. Everywhere I go, I hear people say they want someone who will fight for them. Working people, people who make up the backbone of this country, folks who are on the job, folks who are raising kids, retirees, teachers, people who make car payments, people who make mortgage payments. They want somebody who's going to fight for them, someone who will stand up for them. I am pro-life. I am pro-family, I am pro-Second Amendment, and I am pro-public education. I believe in hard work. I believe in saying, doing what you say you're going to do. I believe in the Great Commission. Love God and love your neighbor. I believe, as my father taught me, to make the world a little bit better every day. And I believe, if you will stand with me, that together we can stand up for District 27. We can stand up for Alabama. Send me back to Montgomery and I will stand up for you. God bless you.